I started remote staff after my second kidney operation when I made a pledge to the doctor. I said, Doc, you remove these cancerous tumors. The left one had four kidneys. Retain as much of my kidney as you can, and I will employ thousands of people. He looked at me and said, Chris, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> no what are you doing? It's my job to look after you. Know? I, don't, I don't care. What are you on about? Uh, my job's to look after you. So, by the way, how many people do you employ? I go, none. We stand today. The Business Method with a shout out. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneur systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, people of all ages, welcome to the Business Method Podcast, where we examine the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. Our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that had built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we are interviewing 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that generate a million dollars or more in annual revenue. There is a growing movement of people building these caliber of businesses and we wanted to get behind the minds, the logic, and the science of what it takes to build a business like this. We've had some incredible guests like Bobby Edwards, the founder of Squatty Potty, who built a $35 million per year company with just 17 employees, and JP Sears, the YouTube superstar whose videos are going viral all over the internet. I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and we hope you enjoy the show. The Business Method. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the show. Today, I am honored to welcome this entrepreneur to the podcast. Our guest today has built an eight-figure location-independent business that profits over seven figures per year. On top of that, he has done it while battling cancer, numerous surgeries, brain operations, and failing kidneys. He literally told the doctors before surgery if he survives one of his first operations, he was going to build a business that employs thousands of people. His name is Chris Jankulovsky, and his story is one that most people don't hear too often, but when they do, it really puts things into perspective. Chris currently runs an 800-person call center called Remote Staff. He started his business after having brain surgery over 10 years ago. Throughout that time, he created a business that produces a lot of jobs, a lot of freedom, and makes a lot of money. We also talk with Chris about staying positive, his mentality around adversity, and leaving this world better off because you are a part of it. It's an eye-opening episode and one I highly recommend that everybody listens to. And without further ado, let's welcome Chris to the show. Entrepreneur systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, I am incredibly happy and excited to welcome Chris Jankulovsky to the show. Chris, I hope I didn't butcher your last name. How are you doing, man? Welcome to the show. That's all good, man. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. Well, good you're. To be here. Yeah, you mentioned you're reporting from Australia, and and um, thank you for tuning in. And we've got some exciting things to talk about. I was introduced uh, to you from a fellow friend and guest of the show, Justin Cook. And I, when I heard your story, I was blown away because um, I love, love, love stories like this and talking to people like you because you've just had so much adversity in your life and you overcome it. And I can tell just from the few minutes that we've spoke that you're incredibly positive and happy to share your message and share your, 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 your vision and, and your story with the world. And so we learned about you in the intro a little bit, but um, you told me, you know, you're, you're doing something uh, amazing with your business, the main business being remotestaff.com.au and you're earning seven figures on your business, but actually eight figures revenue. Is that uh, seven figures profit, I'm guessing, Chris? Yes, it is, yeah. In Australian dollars, of course. Right? In Australian dollars, yeah, yeah. which is yeah. strong now, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think they're pretty strong. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and then, but you also built your businesses through um, – battling with major health issues, cancer, brain operations, major health adversity. And uh, for me, you know, I, whatever you have, and I know your story is going to come out. I, I, I really love sharing these stories with the world because 
it, it makes all of those day to day problems that um, anybody goes through, and especially entrepreneurs, like oh, you know, we're struggling so hard with this project. It makes it seem so small. And, and so I'm going to hand the mic over to you, Chris, and, and just kind of share your story with us and let us know, um, you know, as, as deep as you want to go, just, just feel free to tell us about your journey. Sure. No problem. I'll be delighted to, uh, but look, uh, Chris, it all started, uh, back in 2005, I was, uh, I had a, my first brain operation. I had a big five and a half centimeter tumor. I was speaking at a conference regarding marketing, digital marketing. And, um, and, uh, I had a, I had this, uh, headache for two weeks. I had no idea what it was. And, um, uh, when I went to the doctors and, and they discovered the tumor, they booked me in. That was on a Tuesday. They booked me on a Thursday to have an operation. It's part of the, 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 the part of the brain where there's like a hundred type of different brain operations, but the part of the brain where uh, it controls movement in your body. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I got this tumor because of a hereditary condition I have. It's called von Linda syndrome. It means all my major organs are prone to cysts and tumors, cancer in particular in the kidneys. And so I, I was diagnosed at the age of 19. I'm 45 right now. And when this occurred, I, I don't know, I probably was 31 or 32 years old. And uh, I, I just, like a typical 19-year-old who, who who confronts such devastating, crazy news like this, uh, I, I, I didn't know how to handle it. I just completely ignored it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just said, I don't believe you guys. How would you know what's my missing DNA when you can't even explain what's missing? I don't believe you. So, uh, so yeah, I, I completely ignored it for about 10 years. And then uh, when I was at that seminar speaking and uh, I had that headache for a couple of weeks, staying at a doctor's friend's house, he was the one that insisted, like, get yourself scanned when you get back to Sydney. I got myself scanned, had the uh, diagnosis of this tumor. And when I went to see the doctor, I mean, it's quite a confronting experience to have a brain operation yeah. because it's like, it's very personal. It's like, doc, you're entering my headspace, mate. This is <laughs> private <laughs> terrain. What are you doing? <laughs> you're going to mess me up. But how could you do this? Uh, so it, it, it's not like a leg operation or kidney operation. It's like they're entering your head. Mm-hmm. So it was a very scary experience. But I had the operation. It all came out very successful. And uh, I, I knew that that was my second chance to life. That was, I, I, I knew I, I brushed death right there. But while I was in the hospital, I was laying there and they said to me, while well, I can't move and I'm still recovering a few days into it, they said, look, you haven't got yourself checked uh, for, for 10 years. Let's check the rest of your body to see if there's any more tumors anywhere. And I was like, what? Are you, are you guys crazy? Of course, they wouldn't be totally forgetting. I literally forgot entirely my hereditary challenge. And they scan my body and they find that both my, my kidneys are littered with cancers. Mm. Right kidney had to be removed right away. It was uh, fully occupied, 95% cancers. And they were aggressive. They were four centimeters, three centimeters. It was, it was huge. And this is all pre remote staff days. And so I, 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 I had the brain operation, of course, and I'm there recovering. And now I've got these surgeons all really insisting I have these kidney operations immediately. I, it was all happening so fast. And I had to pause everyone and just really almost in a blasé way, I just said, guys, look, I've had these things in me for 10 years. If they haven't killed me already, if I'm not a dead man already, then let's just chill for a few more months, let me recover, <laughs> and let's deal with the problem later. So they were all a little bit shocked at how casual and blase I was. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It got to a point where I just honestly thought I'm a dead man. It didn't matter. Let me just let me recover and enjoy my remainder that I have left rather than try to fight uh, this battle uh, being in and out of hospitals for the, for the last few days of my life or weeks or months or whatever it was. So, yeah, I took the time off. And uh, I went back to my uh, apartment at Bondi Beach, uh, kind of a famous beach in Australia. And um, I'm overlooking the beach, and I see preparations for the the annual City to Surf Fun Run race. It's a 14 kilometer. I don't know how much it is for our American audience in miles. <laughs> 14 <laughs> kilometer fun run, and um, I never prepared for it. I haven't trained, and I just had a brain operation. I'm 
and the race is going to happen three weeks after my brain operation. Wow. And I don't know why, this, I don't know why I just had this overwhelming desire to just run it. It was like, no other motivation other than it's on, life's on, I want to embrace life. And um, I went to the doctors and nurses and said, guys, look, I'm going to run this race. And they go, but, but Chris, you've just had an operation which controls your movement. Yes, you've got no obvious symptoms, but at any point in time, your body might just stop working while you're in mid-run. So it, it can be kind of damaging. And I said, but is it fatal? And they're like, no, it's not fatal. I go, damn, I'm not. <laughs> Okay. It was fantastic. And when I ran that race two years before with training and everything, I ran it at 65 minutes. My target goal was 60. And then here I am with all the excuses in the world, no training, can't turn my head. And I'm peeing up blood, by the way, from my kidney cancers. Mm. High blood, the body's freaking out. And I run this race. And I ran it with this incredibly, uh, incredible new spring in my feet. And I, I, I was just amazed at how fast I'm moving. I had this big smile on my face. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I'm running towards the finish line, and I couldn't believe, looking at the clock, that I finished it at 58 minutes and 22 seconds. Wow. I was flabbergasted. I was like, what? <laughs> how could this be? And um, it was right then when I realized, um, I mean, how much am I limiting my, myself? Before I've even begun anything in life, how much have I, how much have I sold out before I've even started? And um, and, and that run was just a catalyst to say, Chris, just believe in yourself more and don't underestimate yourself. Don't uh, cut yourself short before you've even begun anything. I mean, just back yourself fully. Stop trying safely, giving this a go, giving that a go. I mean, that was it. Uh, I, I just went all out, and then. From that moment, I had a sense of urgency with life, which I still carry today. I don't want to burn a day. Uh, and I, I recognize that time waits for no one, <laughs> mm -hmm. especially after that experience. I assure you that, um, yeah, it was a real ego blow. Look, you're going to die. We are all going to die. And the world will continue without us. Mm -hmm. What a shock. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, it was time to just get off my high horse and, and, and recognize that, look, I've got to do things now. So I confronted all my adversities. I had a tax loss. I had to negotiate the tax department. I, I confronted decisions I was procrastinating on or excessively thinking about. And then here I am. I've just uh, overcome this adversity that I had to run, which was a mind-blowing experience. And then I had the kidney up, uh, removed. Uh, in November. So I went with friends to Thailand uh, at December of 2015, or sorry, 2004, or five, uh, sorry, five, 2005, getting confused with these dates. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we celebrate. And, uh, you know, I've survived all these battles, and yes, I've still got more kidney, another kidney operation to have. Yes, I've got one more kidney left. Um, but I'm unscathed, and I know, I know it's my real second chance. So uh, it's a long story, but I'm um, coming to the point of saying, well, I came back to Australia, and I realized this is like this is not the right thing for me to do. I need to take a year off. I just need to just, I don't know. My second chance to life was exploring online dating around the world, <laughs> checking out <laughs> what's out there in the world and having fun. <laughs> and, and, and that's what I did. 2006 was an incredible exploration year. And uh, when I got it back from Thailand, I got back to Sydney to make that decision, cleaned up some of my affairs. And a friend of mine was going, mate, I've just set up operations in the Philippines. Why don't you come to the Philippines and I'll get a property. Why don't you hang out here for a couple of months before you decide where you're going to travel? And that's my introduction to the Philippines. And when I went to the Philippines, I was uh, surprised by the English uh, language use, uh, the, the the people, their work ethics, and I just said to my and the price, of course, their wages was ridiculously low. Yeah, and, and of course, I just thought to myself, wouldn't that be nice if I could make this work and utilize these people when I'm back in Australia? <laughs> so I, I hired a few people and and, and, and tried it out and, and got great value. I enjoyed working with them. There was no 
there was no they were willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done to satisfy um, the trust I'd given them and um, and as an entrepreneur who's always compelled by you know one's visions and ideas um, when I got back to Australia I, I after a year taking it off and uh, enjoying the world I I started remote staff after a, a, uh, after my second kidney operation when I made a pledge to the doctor. I said, Doc, you remove these cancerous tumors. The left one had four kidneys. Retain as much of my kidney as you can, and I will employ thousands of people. He looked at me and said, Chris, what the hell are you doing? There's no twist here, mate. What are you doing? It's my job to look after. You know, I don't care. What are you on about? Uh, my job's to look after you. So, by the way, how many people do you employ? I go, none. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so I knew that when I left that, that room uh, that uh, before we had the surgery, I knew that I was going to do something with the Philippines, staffing online, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. And then I had the... Um, kidney operation. Of course, I kept reminding my doctor, give me 10 years, I'll employ thousands. And uh, a few months later, in November of, uh, uh, of 2007, I technically started remote staff, but went full-time into remote staff in June of 2008. I had my kidney operation in February 2008. So I did start the business before that, but that was a, a pledge I made pre-operation. And so um, 10 years have well and truly passed, and I have well and truly hired thousands of people, and my doctor has not only helped me gain 10 years, but has also operated because I continue hereditary. Unlike other cancer people, only uh, 11% get reoccurring cancer. Mm -hmm. With myself, uh, a hereditary uh, kind of condition, I, I know it's going to return, and it always returns. So I had the operation, got my 10 years, I've just had a second operation to remove six cancerous tumors in October last year. So I'm now living on a half a kidney, and uh, everyone's calling me superhuman. <laughs> because <laughs> I've also had that second operation to remove two, two tumors, this time not on the side of my head, but smack in the middle of my head. So, um, so yeah, it was after these second chance for life that I started with my staff, and... Uh, and, and, and I was hungry for life, hungry for achievement, hungry for trying to make a difference, and uh, hungry to continue exploring and making an adventure around the world. Wow. That's an incredible story. <laughs> okay, I've, I've got a lot of questions. We'll dive into the business of things here a little later, but I want to get kind of behind your, your, your philosophy because I think this stuff is really mm -hmm. empowering for both entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs, knowing that you know this is going to come back and knowing that this is something that uh, will be a part of your life um, for your entire life. How, how do you personally stay positive in, well, when the times are hard, but also like you seem talking to you, you seem so uplifting, like um, you seem so happy. You seem very engaging. Like I think people can feel that through the microphone. And and for me, so my first thought here in your story, if I put myself in your shoes, I would think, man, that's heavy stuff to deal with. I don't know if I could stay positive and happy knowing that I have to continue to um, deal with this challenge for the rest of my life. So I'm curious on your point of view on on what keeps you in that 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 good state of mind. Hey, look, uh, after I mean, I dealt with my hereditary condition really badly in my early twenties, and um, and so obviously I, I I I've learned from my past adversities and not handling them so well that. Um, at the end of the day, we are all going to die. It, our mortality is not something to be feared. It's not the concern. I think fearing having the, the life you want, living to your true purpose while you have your time, making the most of your time while you've got it is something you should fear. You know what I mean? Because you're here now, make the most of it. And so I, I learned to distinguish that Things that are out of my control, such as my hereditary condition, that's God's business. You know, let him deal with that. They're the cards I'm dealt with. You know what, mate? They're out of my control. I'll do my best. I'll avoid triggers. They're not feed the cancers. I'll, 
I'll make sure I'm not overweight to, you know, I'll, I'll do my part. I'll be personally responsible for my health as much as I can. But look, I know I'm going to grow cancers. I know I'm going to grow tumors. I know I have many other adversities ahead of me. Okay, this is the card, the life that I've been dealt with. So be it. So I've had to put that aside and recognize that that is one version that doesn't have to defy who I am. And me, this separate entity, this spirit, this uh, person called Chris, this is uh, my creation, this is me. And I'm completely in control of this. And I get to recognize that I make these choices of who and what I am and what I want to do and what I want to, how I want to live and how I want to perceive something. It, you know, the difference between having an operation and seeing it as a curse versus seeing it as a blessing is a vastly different mm. way that the patient will react in. So, um, so you've got to be very uh, mindful of your own philosophies. <laughs> and you've got to be very mindful of your own uh, authentic, truer self. Because every time you confront these mortality uh, challenges, the, the, these life-threatening conditions, I've had eight near-death experiences, by the way, and, and they've all have been serious. They're not like, oh, wow, that could have been a near-death. No, no, he got lucky. He's still alive there. That happened eight times. And then after all these many times, you get to a point where you really got to, you got to really get to a point of going, look, I don't understand why an empowered attitude or being strong or being authentically you is, is really important or has any scientific proof that adds any value to your well-being or health or life. But you know what? When I'm in a battle, I'd rather be strong. <laughs> I'd rather, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd, mm -hmm. I'd just rather be in a better state. And um, and, I, and, I, and I think, um, look, if I had only a few more days to live, I don't want to. I don't want to complain about it. I don't, I don't want a pity party. I want. I, I want to. I want to I wanna then make those the most amazing last few days I have. Uh, I think. I think life is the occasion. And I think it deserves to be celebrated. So when I see people who are playing safe and haven't applied themselves because they're afraid of a failure or, or looking, they've got egg on their face, I just look at them and I go, now what do you think this life's about? Like, you know, well, you think you're going to come out of here unscathed? Or you, well, how else are you going to bloody learn? How else are you going to know that you're pushing your own boundary? How do you know where that boundary is unless you get out there? So until you fail, until you really apply yourself and give it a go and really do a royal fail, like a real proper <laughs> stuff up, <laughs> is the only time you can say that I really tested myself. I really gave something a go. I really applied myself. And I think applying yourself, I mean, it just empowers your spirit. Your, it just empowers this dream that we all have that, wow, I've reached this level of success or this level of experience or capacity in my life. I'm dreaming of this. Imagine if it could only be true. Imagine if it's there for you, but you've got to put in the work. And and putting in that work isn't a safe – it's not in a safety zone. It's in a battlefield. <laughs> and, uh, and so obviously playing in a real-life battlefield for my own life, mm -hmm. playing the entrepreneurial battles in market share and in innovation and in, – Client acquisitions and servicing. I mean, these are, these are, you know, you know, these are like nothing in comparison, of course. What do you, and I imagine, Chris, you probably have, you know, some days that are better and some days that aren't quite as great. I, I'm curious on the days that aren't quite as great for you, what are some of the things that you do personally to help you get back into that, that positive state of mind? Mm. I, I, I look. We all there's always a yin and yang and two sides of life. You know, a pull and a push. You know, there's, there's always two sides of these things. Um, to, for me, to maintain a healthy state of mind and uh, philosophy and worldview and all that, um, I, I just don't. I just don't entertain. Um, um, you know, poor me kind of uh, victim mentality or, um, 
I don't, I don't, I don't entertain. I can't um, because I've always because I, half my body, by the way, doesn't work so well. So um, every time I look at and, and list all these adversities, like by the way, a doctor would assess me uh, every six months on my adversity. It takes two hours just to fully assess all this adversity, and I've got pages of these adversity lists. I look at the list and I recognize when I look at it if I, if I get a paper. And I look at that and I go, that list is always going to be limited compared to the list of what I can do, compared to the list of what I could attempt to do and apply myself to do. So therefore, um, when, 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 when I have a tough day or when I'm kind of you know feeling it or I've got diagnosed again with another cancer or God knows another adversity ahead of me or six, another six months of rehab ahead of me, uh, ahead of me I have to confront that reality of saying, look, charge on. What alternatives do you have that is that, that, that's better? Uh, the, uh, what, what, the alternatives are sobbing, feeling shit for yourself, you know, all this kind of stuff. Like, it's just, why go there? Why not just carry on? And when you carry on, there's something, you might as well, if you're going to carry on, if you are going to go through the process, you might as well hope and believe that your tomorrows are even better mm. and you are yet to experience them. You might as well. You might as well. I mean, I think when you get to a point where, like me, especially when you get so many cancers, you can never entertain that point of saying, well, this is pointless. Uh, you know, what's the, you know, uh, life is uh, meaningless in this journey. Why, why am I always uh, having to finally want to get back on my feet and I'm having to get, knock down again and I get up and and uh, like I've been there before like because after my uh, second brain operation I uh, my speech was affected my sight was affected I was bed bound for three months it took me six seven months to rehabilitate to walk and use my arm again to talk and it was a big journey and I remember when I woke up uh, for the first two weeks I was saying this is no way to live. Are you for real? You guys expect me to live like this? This is a joke. This is crazy. I can't I open my eyes. There's two visions. One's flipping one way, the other's flipping the other. This is ludicrous. Uh, I go to wipe my own ass and, and, and there's shit all over my head. Excuse the language. But, you know, like, I couldn't look after myself at all. The first one month, I needed care 24-7. And I just stood there looking at the, at the, uh, at the clock when – when, when an hour was such a mission to just get through, let alone a day. And I'm there going, man, this is certainly nowhere to live. But then while I was there, uh, my wife uh, you know, was pulling me up. Uh, I, was, I was verbally grieving, and, uh, and she was there by, by my side all the way, listening, entertaining, whatever dramas or stories or whatever I was uh, grieving. And... Um, and we we're just working through it, and and she was pregnant, by the way, with her second son. So mm -hmm. the moment I started feeling somewhat myself again uh, was the time when uh, she had a hip slug, she had a cold, the eye infection, this and that, and all these dramas. It's like all of a sudden she let loose, and then it was like the tables had turned. Even though I'm still in the bed and I haven't got out of bed, mm -hmm. um, I felt like I was looking after her. And then the moment I uh, used rehab for about three weeks to learn how to get to the shower, learn how to get downstairs, learn how to get in the car, walk outside with, with these hardcore heavy duty four-legged things. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I walked to the car, managed to get in the car, you know, it was just in time. I gained my independence just in time to be there for the birth of my second son. Oh, wow. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. Hey, listeners, we're going to wrap up the first part of Chris's interview here, and then we're going to publish the rest of Chris's interview tomorrow on the next episode. Make sure you tune in and check it out as Chris dives deeper into building his eight-figure business while managing all the health issues that he had. 
Hey listeners, thanks again for joining the show. We wanted to remind you about our Get Shit Done one-on-one productivity coaching that we recently just launched. What we do is work with you to create big business goals that are absolutely game changers. We make a plan together and put you in our productivity hacking system that helps you stay on target. Each week you get a call with yours truly about what steps to take for the following week. Some say it's like a year of productivity in just three months. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com forward slash coaching. Thebusinessmethod.com forward slash coaching.